so I learned that that was the industry I wanted to get into. And I didn't know exactly what role I would play, but what I learned through my college when U of I had this interdisciplinary or it's more broadly known as eye health program. When you're in the school, um, I learned how broad it was. And I connected with a lot of professors who then connected me with other people that did graduate from the program and were actively working. So I had mentors my junior and senior year in the field too. So one thing kind of just kept building and leading to another that got me to realize that that was where I wanted to be. Welcome to the show. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share these shows with your friends. We're here to help everybody figure out what their career is. And today we have Nevena Milosevic on the show, who's going to talk about being a healthcare concierge. Probably don't know what that is. She's going to get into paths into healthcare outside of being a practitioner. And there are quite a few of them. She's going to talk about process to achievement in your next step. And she's going to talk about how to ID and utilize the resources around you that are prevalent. She's going to get into how she did it. Welcome to the show and welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Nevena, thank you so much for making time to come and share your insight and experience on the Edge of Excellence today. Thank you for having me, Matt. It's really exciting to be here today. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to start off the way we always start off. What is your definition of excellence? I would say that my definition of excellence would be when people realize that whatever goal that they're trying to achieve in life is really in their possession and they take ownership and control over their life. And it's really tied to recognizing that, again, the whatever you are envisioning in your mind, um, when you have that vision and you put in towards actions that you are you know, being very deliberate and intentional about, um, that's really creating you know, your dream life and whatever you are leveling up for yourself. So I think that when people have that mindset and take accountability for their lives, they they are at that excellence because at the end of the day, we're going to be growing and evolving throughout all of time. And once we realize that potential within ourselves, you know, we, we can do and achieve anything that we desire. So you have a goal that I, I am assuming it's got to be a big goal that you've had for a long time. And Goals do change. And, you know, there's a podcast on goal setting that people can look up in the beginning. Goals change mm -hmm. and your values, your values don't usually change too much, but they become clear. Your goals change, hopefully, because you realize that you have more t potential, but sometimes they get ratcheted down. But excellence, I'm assuming you have to have some goal you've had for a while that, you know, is tied to your values, that is important to you and that you're striving to. And then if you have this deliberate action tied to that, you take control, don't get distracted. You achieve excellence. Yeah. Did I capture it? I think you capture it. All right. I'm going to have to think more about that one as we move on. Well, I'm going to dive into what you do because you have an, first of all, you have an interesting major, one of the first people interdisciplinary healthcare major. That's an interesting major. You went into healthcare consulting, which maybe a lot of people don't know what that is. And then you moved into management and leadership in healthcare consulting. So what is a healthcare consultant? What do you do? And what sort of majors would people have in college that would help them get into that industry? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, there are actually two different um, aspects of like healthcare consulting that you can get into. One is a little bit more on like the business side of it. So if you're working for a more like, like a larger corporation or for hospitals, um, you get into that side of it. But the other aspect is actually working with patients and patient advocacy. So that was my experience. So this is the first job that I got out of college was more a focus on being like the patient advocate and a consultant to them. So the company I worked for, they obviously they had other employees. One of our clients was EY, for example. Walgreens was one of the clients that I worked on, but I didn't work with 
too much of the executives. I worked with the patients hand on. And so I was an advocate for them, for their healthcare benefits, um, helping them understand, you know, the whole intricacies of the market, um, whether it be, you know, their benefits financially and working in billing, whether it be for insurance inquiries, whether it be for just their whole health, really holistic uh, experience and trying to get set up with even like primary care physicians. It's just healthcare in the U.S. Is, can be very complicating. And so my goal was to make it, you know, be a part of the solution and be able to get people to understand, you know, how to you know maneuver the market so that they, you know, wind up having their own and they can be accountable and they can also take ownership over their own care rather than getting confused in the whole system. So that was my first exposure into it. Sounds like this is a industry on either side. You're working with the hospital, I assume, dealing with the hospital's patient uh, patients on the patient side as well, if you're a healthcare consultant? Yes. So the first part wasn't actually, it was more so because every, you know, when you go into work, you wind up having each, all of our employers, they give you healthcare insurance. Usually that's the largest employers are the ones that give you insurance. And so many people, they, you know, sign up for a health plan and benefits, but they don't really know how to utilize like their insurance or how to go with okay. a provider in their network. So it was more so for the ones that were just, you know, for anybody, regardless of where they worked and they would, they were insured. We worked with their companies and their employees. That was my first exposure. The second half is the hospital. So first of all, it sounds to me like in your role, working as a patient advocate, the patient advocate side of the healthcare consulting, um, you have to enjoy leadership through conversation. You said that you help them navigate, but you also said um, help them become accountable and help them take ownership. So this sounds like really solid communication skills, experience with communication um, needed to go into that sort of role. And it looks like someone that's going to thrive in leadership through conversation. Is that the type of experience? Is that a big part of your job? That was, yes, that was a huge part because within that role, it was so much interaction on a daily basis with patients themselves. So learning, you know, how to connect with that person, learning what their you know, what their questions are, what their concerns are. And when you're the one with that knowledge and expertise, you have to learn, you know, what questions, what are they actually asking and knowing how to deliver that in a way that's digestible for the, you know, the patient or the consumer in that perspective. All right. So someone that wants to go into healthcare consulting, I and mean, we'll, we'll just start off with this communication skills piece and get into it deeper later. What sort of majors are they in, in, in uh, college? And they're going straight into healthcare consultant out of college if they have the right experience? Yes. It's funny because when I worked uh, at that first job as a healthcare consultant, I worked with the people with a vast variety of um, degrees. So many people were, did have healthcare degrees. Some even had masters actually, but it was like what if some of them were more like healthcare administration, community, you know, healthcare, there's a lot of different healthcare majors you can get into um, depending upon the college that you're in. So there were a lot of those. There were even people that were a bit more science-based, like, you know, biology, chemistry as their background. But I did also see people that were, you know, business majors themselves even, whether it be, you know, econ and, you know, whatever, honestly, all majors. But I would say the ones that I saw thrive in it were a bit more focused within that, within the healthcare industry and having that mindset while you're in college and driving that factor. But it was one of those roles where you could, you could also be from a very different background and again, a bit more biology based or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, what really mattered within success in that role, because it was so off the bat was, you know, your purpose and mission for what you're trying to do uh, going into consulting and also just having that knowledge of building those relationships. And obviously a little bit of, you know, analytical skill sets because you're going to be working with you know a little bit of numbers and things like that there but a lot of it you do learn on spot and you know when you're on the job directly so in terms of your major you know you can be flexible with it but i would say the success does come when you do have a bit of that clarity that that is something that you want to go into so you, your major will align towards that 
Oh, well, let's get into how you became clear. So let's go back. We're going to back up. You got into uh, healthcare consulting. You moved over to care continuity. And by the way, if you want to find uh, Nevena, she's on LinkedIn. It's uh, N-E-V-E-N-A dash M-I-L-O-S-E-V-I-C dash Texas. <laughs> dash Texas. Uh, you can find her on yeah. LinkedIn and uh, care continuity continuityprogram.com is the company. So you, you went from healthcare um, consulting to healthcare consulting management. You got into this new cool company, which we'll talk about in a second. But way before that, way before that, you're out in Morton High School in West Berwyn in the famous Chicagoland. What was life like in high school? What were you doing? Were you trying to get ahead? Were you trying to set yourself apart? Were you just cruising? What was up? Oh my gosh, I was such a tryhard in high school. I was definitely focused on getting out as early as possible. Not that I finished early by any means. I graduated within the four normal years, but I definitely knew that I wanted to be, you know, amongst one of the top in my class and do as much as I possibly could to be, you know, a good student. But even from that age, I knew that there was more to success um at that time which in my mind at that moment in life ever since I started you know high school was going to college so I knew that what colleges were looking for was a you know a diverse student so not only good at academics but also you know are you involved involved in your community and in sports are you trying to do things for yourself to build your leadership um even if you aren't you know a born leader you know you can be a learned leader and so I knew that I always wanted to stay active and utilize my time. So I didn't, um, I didn't have a job to, during the majority of high school because I was always involved in sports. I was a two-sport athlete throughout the whole year at school. And then throughout the whole year, I also danced um, for actually Serbian folk dancing group uh, with my church since I was in elementary school all the way through senior year of, senior year of high school. So I was very focused on academia, but also on, you know, building myself up even from that age, because I knew I wanted to get as involved as possible. Uh, and I always was very focused on just like the next steps in my life. Which so you're for me. so for early and, and if you're listening right now in high school, you work this way, by the way, this weekend is the busiest weekend of the year for me. It's college apps are due on Monday weekend. And I help uh, my kids, friends, and my friends' kids with their college apps. So I've got all these girls raiding into my house this weekend to have their essays proofed and uh, ready. And some of them thought strategically long ago, and they've been preparing. Most of them have done, you know, some sort of sport, uh, usually out of love of the sport, um, not always out of the strategic thinking. Um, they've gotten involved in something usually out of the strategic thinking. So you're strategically thinking in high school of the next step. And it worked because you got into a great school, the University of Illinois and Champaign, Illinois, and you got into this strange major. So you must have known early in life that you wanted to go into this form of healthcare, or did you not know that's why you did interdisciplinary? No, I, I didn't know actually always. When I was in kind of at the end of high school, I definitely, I got very interested actually in psychology. Um, and I thought that, you know, the human minds and human experience and connections was always just appealed to me so much. And when I studied that senior year, I got so intrigued. And when I went to visit U of I campus, actually, I met with a lot of kids that were, you know, psychology majors and professors. And I was like, this is it. This is my niche. But when I got to college, I also went in with a very open mind and I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to go in. I have this major in mind, but I also know that college is all about experiences. It's all about broadening your horizons. So, you know, go ahead and start a major. But because I wasn't 100% set in stone on that, I opened myself up to a lot of different opportunities. And I was really trying hard to figure out what were my greatest skill sets and so that I could, you know, enjoy what I was studying, but also make sure that it was also going to, you know, be something that I could find good work in after school um, and have those two worlds blend together, um, which is certainly a privilege. You know, not everybody gets to do a job that they love. Sometimes that those are very two separate categories for people. But I knew I wanted to build a career, which was different from a job. And I wanted to find that path throughout college. So 
gosh, during my freshman and sophomore year, I was kind of a mess um, in terms of my major. I was taking all sorts of classes, calling my mom, telling her, I'm going to be a forensic psychologist or I'm going to get into economics. I was just trying all these different things, thinking about business school potentially, you know, as like a minor. I, I was jumping around a lot, but through, you know, the core of that and actually through a lot of the relationships that I made while I was doing college works um, and different classes I was taking, I just, something within me kept, kept realizing just the significance of health and circling back to like the, you know, human connection experiences, mind, body, wellness, all of that, the importance of that was highlighted to me through my own downfalls um, when I let, you know, my own health go a little bit and I was, you know, didn't have all my priorities aligned. So I learned that that was the industry I wanted to get into. And I didn't know exactly what role I would play, but what I learned through my college when U of I had this interdisciplinary or it's more broadly known as eye health program. When you're in the school, um, I learned how broad it was. And I connected with a lot of professors who then connected me with other people that did graduate from the program and were actively working. So I had mentors my junior and senior year in the field too. So one thing kind of just kept building and leading to another that got me to realize that that was where I wanted to be. Okay, so you thinking next step in, in high school, probably didn't know exactly where you wanted to go to college, but you're strategically thinking, put my um, effort in the right place. You get into college again, you're open-minded. You don't know exactly what you want. You have this definition of what a real career is instead of a job. So you're open-minded, you're, you're sort of serendipitously looking around. And that theme comes up in this podcast a lot. When people don't know what they want to do, they got to be open-minded. I would argue if you do know what you want to do, you're probably wrong. So you got to be open-minded. So you, you start off with this open-minded major. You know you want to go into healthcare because you've got these reasons. I wanted to go into healthcare too, and I went and saw surgery and I passed out. Who would have thunk it? I pass out when blood starts squirting everywhere. Can't really be a doctor. So people that maybe want to go into healthcare, but you know they want to be a nurse, they want to be a doctor. I do this show to expand people's minds beyond what they already know from watching TV, which is where most people get their career exposure. So if you don't know what you want to do, you might take this interdisciplinary a health major, but you also said there's many other healthcare majors. There's many other science majors that can lead into the healthcare industry. Maybe you want to go into sales. Maybe you want to go into um, uh, healthcare advocacy or healthcare consulting. Maybe you want to go into healthcare practitioner. Who knows what you want to do? You can look, and if you're still in college, you can look and check out those different majors. And, and a lot of the time, it's usually science-related. I don't know if you're a science-type person. You like psychology first. But your job is more on the communication side. And um, we, we talk about disc tests earlier at podcast eight or something like that. You must be somewhat of an I on the disc score and maybe somewhat of a C. So you kind of cross over and hit both of those, and you've combined those into your career? Yeah, absolutely. And circling back to what you were talking about, with if someone's listening in there, you know, is still in college, even people with like communications and marketing degrees, they, they can get into healthcare because you're right. Most people, when they think healthcare, it's, you know, it's clinical, which is what you were describing, you know, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, radiologist, like there's a lot clinically, but within the U.S., over 40% of the profit in healthcare now comes from like the administration side, but it's not even just being, you know, like operational manager and hiring and staffing. There is now such a need for hospitals to figure out, you know, like again, their, uh, but the technology that's going to be best for their, you know, their patients, whether it's going to be you know, a system that communicates with them or whether it's going to be hands on at the, at the hospital. So there's just, there's a plethora of things that you can get into and, you, you know, as long as you have an interest in it, it doesn't really matter what your major is because you'll find a way to blend it so that you can sell yourself and show these companies and these people, this is what I'm getting into. And when you find that company, they'll then see, you know, you're eager, you want to learn, you're coachable and adaptable, and you have this interest and you have knowledge, you, you know how to study, you've gotten this degree. So you're putting your passions and interests out there and building yourself up. It's really an endless place. 
where you can find yourself, whether it's technology, whether it's again, like marketing and design, even you can find a role. Okay. So healthcare has a lot of options for a lot of different types of person, behavioral patterns, and a lot of different majors. You went into this healthcare consulting in college though, you're, you're kind of honing in, you start off broad. What sort of things were you doing in college? I know you did the college works thing. What else did you do besides college works to figure it out and to hone in? Um, so one of the things that I did when I was getting into, um, when I got, well, college works really was a very huge part of my life because I started in college um, and I started that uh, my freshman year. So second semester, freshman year, all the way through uh, junior year because I did the branch manager, rookie DM, and then I started off a second DM year for myself. And so I built a lot of relationships and connections there. And I found my circle. I found the people that I was closest aligned to like-minded that then helped me like open up and broaden my own horizons and kind of find myself. So when I wasn't, you know, working there, um, I was starting to build other health habits for myself and, you know, working out and meeting people at social events at, at college you know, not just the parties, but even, you know, like going to the rec and random sports and stuff. You just, you join and you start off and, and you do these things in clubs and met some people there. But where I really found myself figuring out my major was through connecting with professors, actually. So it sounds super cheesy, probably, but I really was that student that would sometimes go, if I liked a professor, I would go to their office hours and just chat with them. And one of the professors, you know, I, I think myself for this every, not every day, but when I look back, um, I'm very thankful for it. I connected with her and told her, you know, I want to do healthcare, but I don't want to do what a lot of the kids in my major are doing. Like, I don't want to do physical therapy, occupational therapy, or PA. I want to get into this other side that I know exists, but I don't know how to get there. And she then had a previous student that majored, um, his name attach him and he was already a few years into it he worked on the emr side which was electronic medical records and worked for a big company called cerner and so through connecting with him then then somebody that was already in the field he helped me see what life was going to be like after graduation and so i had a mentor then that was actively in the field of what i saw myself doing and helping put the pieces of the puzzle together for myself so lots of putting yourself out there lots of trying you know, there were things that I did where I tried out for like a fraternity, a business one at U of I, but I didn't get into it. Ironically, I wasn't accepted um, and stuff. So, you know, lots of trial and error during college, I'd say, to really help find myself. So you use one of my favorite words, but I think you used it incorrectly. Cheesy. I, I love the use of the word <laughs> cheesy, but it does not sound cheesy. And it's funny that you say that because, you know, when you're in high school, I think about this all the time because I have a daughter who's graduated from high school. It's just so the so not the real world, what is cool and um, what people want to emulate, especially now and reading all these essays. It's just so amazing what high school kids have gone through. And it's not COVID. I'm talking about the mental health mm -hmm. issues that they've been exposed to and the challenges. They've been, I'm just blown away by how difficult it is. And what's cool in high school and cool in the early parts of college is really, yeah, fun. But if it's if it's your whole life, it's kind of looked down on later. So it's cool to be that cool person and that partying person and, you know, be the social person. Later in life, it's cool to um, be social because you're taking care of people. And if you're partying all the time, you're pretty much a loser. So it's not cheesy at all to people that are excellent. It's not cheesy at all to use your resources. So, and you think about the resources, um, professors. Huh, let's see, why would I want to be a professor? Um, is it because I want to harm the world? No, it's because I want to help the next generation. I mean, the only reason to do that job is to share your knowledge. The most important job in the world without teachers, we wouldn't have anything. No one would know how to do anything. So they're there for an altruistic reason. Do you think that maybe they would want to help you? Probably. Are you sitting in the room with them right now? Yeah. Could you just walk over and say hi and talk to them? Might make their day. And what do you know? This is why, I mean, this is a crazy 
um, industry you went into, you had to weed your way through to find these different jobs. What do you know? The professors have been there and done that. So you're using your resources on campus, not cheesily, smartly. Cheesily is a good word too. And, uh, and looking around, it's back to serendipity. You don't know what your next step is, but you're thinking strategically about next steps, high school, college, out of, out of college. Um, if you're already out of college, it's not too late to start now. You can go back and talk to the professors now. You can look around and serendipitously think, what resources do I have to help me clarify the jobs out there? Who do I need to talk to? Um, and what do you know? They might hook you up with somebody else. The other thing you said that was interesting was healthy habits. So you basically started hanging out where people that were moving in the direction that you wanted to move were hanging out at the gym and at the different clubs. And then College Works, relationships and connections, strange because it's a stupid painting company. <laughs> How did you serendipitously find the relationships and connections at College Works uh, during those three hellacious years of torture? <laughs> well, my first year, my branch manager year there, I found the relationships really built in the summertime um, because that's when like during all those, you know, crazy pay payroll events and things like that. And all of the, you know, the, the sessions that we'd have as a team, you know, on campus, it was good, but sometimes it'd be hard to, you know, get everybody's schedules to sometimes align. So it was more of like during the summer after you really put in the work throughout the year and worked directly with like your, you know, district manager and you're working in your own business and you get that foundation of what this is all about. Then when you see the people that have stuck it out and made it into the summer, then you're getting into production. And, you know, I realized when I was doing the internship production went well for me, but I did realize, you know, other people I was, you know, their life was maybe a little bit easier where I was like, you know, bruising myself up and sleeping for like four hours a night and, you know, starting things off. Um, and so I really just saw, you know, the people that were doing the internship, we were all, although we were all different majors and probably there for different, you know, short-term purposes, I think long-term, we all knew we wanted to, you know, reach our best selves and do this program that was gonna, you know, it was built for a college student to try in an environment where, you know, almost anybody who proves themselves willing to learn and willing to try and take, um, you know, be coachable and, you know, want to get exposure into what, quote, the real world would look like. Um, and I say, quote, because that always like irritated me. I was like, I am in the real world. I'm living. Like, what do you mean the real world is waiting for me? But then I saw, you know, okay, that this is what they mean. It's not all textbook. It's not black and white. You really have to learn <laughs> how to communicate, you know, taxes and like, you know, all these other things that you take into account. And so the people that, you know, I met during that summertime was very eye opening to see. And then, uh, even being then district manager year, although it was a very challenging and different year, the people that I was working with at, you know, U of I at that time particularly, and then even from other college campuses, I I just saw the, the trend in that all these people were, again, wanting the best for themselves and genuine for their life and next path and willing to work together and help each other out and make it as fun of an experience but we all you know didn't want to only fixate our lives on you know paint jobs um, we wanted to make life better and enjoyable together so we'd really work together get together as much as possible you know on the weekends you know build our business make those fun sunday calls <laughs> um, whether it be to you know when you're recruiting and you're you know as a district manager you're, you're building your team or when you're when you've built your team and you're working and you're out there with homeowners and stuff it was a really collaborative experience and so because i was investing so much time i naturally found myself building the most relationships there and so thankfully because to this day my four best girlfriends are all from college works um, and even you know all of them i plan to see some at my you know down the line wedding one day and things like that. We, we really are just so connected, although we're all in different parts of the world um, and all spread out. We, we are each other's core in a lot of ways. Who are your four best girlfriends from College Works? <laughs> so I have, maybe I'm not even counting properly, but if Monica, Adamchik, um, Charlie White, Katie, Marissa, 
though we, I stay in touch with those girls the most, um, even Jenny Nowick, um, we, she actually works at the same company as I do now. Uh, we got connected as I started and then she was looking for a new job and I was like, Hey, my company's growing and expanding and she was interested in healthcare, but wanted something new. So, so she's using her resources. <laughs> she was using her resources too. Yes. Okay, so uh, shout out to uh, Monica, Katie, Marissa, Jenny, and who else did you say? Um, Christy? Monica, Katie, Marissa, Charlie, Charlie. Um, Rachel as well, Rachel Tarlick, Um, And we all are very connected into each other's lives. Well, that's fantastic. So back to, so it's the serendipity, but it's, I think it's the strategy. And this is all about exposure to career. So we're going to get into healthcare in a second again. But you're you're going through your life, uh, trying to figure out what your plan is, knowing kind of the direction you're going, and then serendipitously, and also strategically finding your way. So College Works is kind of a vetting program of friends for you. They have the same values. They're putting in the same effort. They have, uh, you know, integrity is a big issue for them. They're trying real hard. I belong to some of these uh, business clubs, and people go, "Why? Why do we all get along so much?" Well, because you got to get into the thing. You got to go through an interview process. You're vetting your values. So college works is like an interview process. Well, there is an interview process and then a vetting process for friends. And you know, it's amazing that people create these business partnerships and stay together so long. Unfortunately, college works isn't offered outside of the Midwest anymore. So other people, if you're in college can look at different internships, but the hardness of it, the difficulty of it, the demanding of it, not only does it really help you with your resume because you get to run a business and do all the stuff that you never get to do, it's a better vet for your social group. It's a be better vetting for the employers, but it's a better vetting for your social group. So you, you're in college, you're working all three years. Oh my God, how do you do that? Um, setting yourself apart. You come out of college, so you had a lot more experience than most people do and got into healthcare consulting immediately. If people hadn't done you know, all the hard work that you did, um, they would go into what before they became a healthcare consultant? Oh gosh. Um, I mean, I see a lot of people and, you know, it depends. Um, I, a lot of people that didn't, you know, not necessarily only just do college works, but maybe didn't take the initiative in college period to kind of do things to step out of their comfort zone and yeah. try and connect and, you know, any type of work, any organization that you kind of put yourself into. I think if you're putting in that, again, that energy and intention behind it, you're going to get something out of it that, you know, is worthwhile. So if you don't do that, um, you might not get, a very fun or good job or as much as you think that your degree was actually worth. Um, so maybe you do, you know, you don't even go into like a corporate job and not that, that that's necessarily like the definition of success by any means whatsoever, but it is kind of the trajectory of where, you know, most kids do start to get that initial exposure. And then once you go into like a bigger company, then you, it gives you like a little bit of, you know, an eyeball of where you're going to, what exists and what's out there and when you go from you know some experiences in college and then you go into that world you can blend those two things and decide for yourself do i want to stay and quote move up that ladder or do i maybe want to you know go back and build something for myself or go smaller and work with a startup or you know give yourself that flexibility and autonomy and i think if you don't do things for yourself while you're in college and you do choose the college path it's like what's your purpose because when you get out you're going to be lost all over again. You're going to, and you'll end up, you know, I don't think any job is like a bad job, but I think that if you want something where you're putting the degree that you took four years of your life to get to become, you know, something valuable and that you can grow with and build a career from, that that is a little bit more of, you know, again, if you're intentional behind that, where you're, you'll be happier with yourself and with your results. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about your definition of excellence. The, the goal is in your possession. You have this great career, this dream job, this wonderful life because you had ownership and control through life and you had this deliberate action. And so, you know, this is a great, a great message for, for people starting off college. And I run into people that went through college and they didn't quite get the message. And, you know, they didn't have a parent or somebody telling them they just went through the motions and they figure it out later what are some entry level positions for people that may have had these same majors that may want to get into consulting, but 
just don't have any experience yet. They just figured it out today. They listen to the podcast. They want to get on the train to excellence. Um, they were screwing around partying too much in college and, and missed a few years of internships. What could they do for a couple of years that would lead them into this consulting role, this communication role, this leadership role? What sort of leadership experiences and, and things could they get as entry level jobs leading there? Entry level, you know, focusing in on like the healthcare field specifically. I mean, there's always roles of, you know, being like, you know, a, a concierge and working for a company because actually that my company does have that side of it where it's like it's the concierge so that's who I manage so um you know the concierge role you're doing a little bit more working like you know with offices and scheduling and doing um you know the care navigation side of things for patients and so it gives you like that leg into you know you're in the field but you're you know you don't necessarily maybe have all of like the people skills you don't have the um ability so you haven't had the exposure to lead as much and so you need that leg in so that is one way getting into that anything regarding like working at like a clinic at the front off you know front desk for example you get in and you start working with the, those people you're going to start to if you're at you know again intentional behind it you're going to learn from them you're going to learn how insurances work you're going to learn how the clinic runs itself and then you start paying attention to how other offices do their things and then you might, you know, say, I rather than clinical, I want to do something, work at a hospital. And so you can start the same way. Okay. Start really basic and entry level there. Okay. So you were purposeful and directed in college and did this crazy stuff to get yourself the leadership skills. If you haven't, you're listening right now, it's not too late. You just got some ideas. You came straight out, went into skip the concierge role, went into the consultant role. Now you're in the leadership and management role. What's a day in the life like? What are you doing in your role now? Um, so my company now switched from, you know, when I started with the light, if we're a larger corporation, work with care continuity is still within, you know, they've been around for about like seven years. So in the business world, it's still relatively a bit of like a startup and they're growing a lot. And so being a program manager at the company now exposes me to actually wear a lot of different hats. And so my day-to-day -day looks really different actually daily. It's all about, you know, because of the company, it's, uh, it functions to help the emergency departments at hospitals and navigating their patients, particularly from the, the emergency room and aftercare from that. And so sometimes, you know, it's looking at what happened the previous day and what do we need to do today to cap based on the volume. Sometimes it's working and coaching the concierges directly um, so that they do better with the patient interaction. Sometimes it is now that I, do, I am involved more in the hospital executive meetings inside of things. So it's working with their, their leadership team. Sometimes it's working with offices. So it really is a lot of different, you know, things that you're juggling and balancing on a daily basis. But I enjoy that because I'm not the type of person that likes to just sit at a desk and do the same task on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I like to always try and be, you know, growing and expanding myself. So it's nice to have been there, you know, over like a year now on my end and see like a, a little bit of a routine for some things uh, within healthcare because it's such a growing field in general, I'm really having to stay very uh, purposeful every day and on top of what's happening and changes in the whole industry so that our company can always stay on top um, of the market and, and its needs. So it's constantly changing for me. So it sounds like uh, just your whole attitude aligns perfectly with a role in this seven year startup business. And you had the big corporate job. And by the way, if you're listening and you're in your car and you're on 1.5 speed, I sound, first of all, I sound way better on 1.5 speed. Second of all, big to small is easier than small to big when you come out of college. So, you know, our company, CollegeWorks is a real small company, but we're training people with skills that go into other companies. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the internships. I'm talking about if you want to work in a big corporation one day, which I don't want to do, uh, you start there and then you move to a smaller, smaller company. It's much easier than starting small and going big. You started big and then decided to go into this small startup. And it sounds like it's a perfect fit for you. And, and you think, look at this discussion today, thinking about the next step, thinking strategically, being open-minded, um, serendipity, 
all of a sudden you got to wear a bunch of different hats. Well, you better be open-minded. You better be flexible. You better have some experiences that are weird, like uh, being a district manager and all that stuff you've done. Um, you better be looking for the, the next flower and the next opportunity. So you found something that's kind of a perfect fit and it's perfect fit for you. It may not be perfect for someone else listening right now, but how did you decide between big and small and how did you figure out this perfect fit? Um, I decided that I needed a change for myself when I was in my first job, it was actually around like the six, well, about like actually the eight, eight month mark to where I was like, I was learning the company and how it was growing. And I was seeing my, you know, what my managers were doing. And I was like, okay, what's my potential? Like with, if, you know, they say, when you get a job, look at like the CEOs and, or the, your managers and whatever they're doing, that's going to be your life. So do you want your life to be what theirs is? Or are you interested in something else for yourself? And so in my first job, I was involving myself in a lot of other different projects, actually, at the time, because, you know, COVID was actually happening. And I started, we, we went from office to remote and lots of changes. So I was trying to get involved in how can I help company culture and just different things aside from the day-to-day tasks that I was doing. And throughout that, I knew, okay, if I, you know, I actually sent a message to my own self and I told myself if once I finish you know this project um, and it was actually being like a part of the they were called culture champions and they we were the group of people that was taking an assessment of all the employees and trying to make changes in the company Mm -hmm. and so it was like a, a couple months of being involved there and I told myself okay if I you know do this and I really like it I'm gonna know I want to grow in this role but if at the end of that project, if I don't, if I'm not really happy still, and I'm not finding that it's my niche, I know I have to take a step back and find something new. And so that's where I found myself. I wasn't the happiest. um, And I realized I needed a change. And so I started to look introspectively. And I was like, okay, what's out there where, you know, I know healthcare is still the only thing that I really want to be involved in but I don't want necessarily just the consulting role that I had um, and only working with like the patient advocacy side. I want to do something that's more broader level because my initial role is much more like one-on-one. And I want to be involved in something in, with a company that is a little bit more mission driven and changing the system. And so I had that idea and then I was looking all over uh, for four months. It took me to find you know the company that I'm at right now with care continuity and I was looking for, you know, exactly what I landed on. I wanted something that was mission driven, connecting the, you know, impacting patients still, but more systematic and strategic because that was, you know, my interest. And so I eventually found that. And I did like the fact that it was smaller because for me, you know, when I was interviewing, it wasn't just that they were smaller, but they were growing rapidly based on the technology that they had and so that appealed to me because there was a sense of you know quote job security which security is an illusion to itself um but i i just liked what it had and it felt like the next stepping stone for myself all right so this show is not called the edge of uh whatever it's not (laughs) called the edge of you know pretty good i think it's called the edge of excellence So that's a lot of stuff right there. Oh my God. I got to take a nap after thinking about that. Four months. Takes four months to get a job. It doesn't take four weeks, three weeks. It doesn't take one application. And that's the number that I find as I coach different people and looking for jobs. It takes four months. It takes work. So you look at this, that you're back to your same theme again. What's my next step? Um, What's my strategy? Serendipity. So the strategy is, what is the next step here if I stay here? Let me try that out and then worry about it. So I want to flag that. A lot of people worry about what if scenarios. What if I don't do well in the test? What if I don't like the job? What if the career isn't right? What if there's nothing out there? Um, Well, let's wait on that until you know why. Why worry about something that hasn't happened yet? So you figure out your strategy. You think about the path. You look for the pattern. You try the pattern. You decide it's not right for me. Then it's time to not worry to execute. And you put forth this effort. And, you know, 
I don't know, it doesn't have to be specific, but you're obviously looking at what you want in the company. You have mission driven, you have the growth rate, um, you have a, a little techno a technological element to it. You know the things that you like to do. I call it wormholing. You just spend an hour a day on the internet, getting yourself lost in companies, getting yourself lost in paths. You're, it starts to sing to you in your case, because you've got a lot of experience um, and you spend the time to identify the right place after back to your goal and possession, ownership and control of life after a long period of time of control. So it doesn't matter if you got out of college and you blew it, and didn't do internships, or you spent three years with us taking disc tests and all the crap that we did with you. Um, at some point in time, you put in a few years. And then at some point in time, you stop and you look around and say, is this the right path? And you check out the next step. And then you either get on a new train, which I never did. I've been on the same train ever since I was uh, 20, 20 years old in college. Um, or you get on a new train, which most people do, and you vet that path and you vet the process and you invest the time and then you find the dream career and you're on the edge of excellence. I got one more question for you, Nevena. What sacrifices did you make back in time that, that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I had to do this. Maybe I'm not going to do that. That big thing at the time that was a sacrifice that you look back and you go, thank God I did that. I would say in college, um, the biggest sacrifice was sometimes those like social events um, and some those parties that, you know, people were going to and, you know, join like, you know, joining like the Greek life because it was so big at U of I and things like that. And another big sacrifice that I actually made, not only with that, was at that time, I, want, I was interested in doing the study abroad. Uh, but it was my junior year that I was contemplating that. And it was like between actually it was sophomore or junior year. But I was like, do I continue college race and grow myself or do I take a step back? I did it one year and I go study abroad and I do the typical kind of college path. And I remember having a conversation with my district manager at that time. who was actually Kyle Look. And he told me, you can travel after college. Like, you know, you don't have to, you can do it on your own where you're not worried about studying and you're not worried about like classes and stuff. You can just go out and experience things. And for that, I was thankful um, because, you know, travel is a big value of mine and in my life. And I knew I always wanted to get there, but I figured, you know, while I'm in college, let me go ahead and just kind of utilize this, these, this pool of resources that I've built for myself in this community and, you know, I looked up to him so much. He was a huge mentor of mine and he, you know, I, I valued his guidance and I think back to his words, you know, frequently it was, uh, it was, I was very torn. Um, but I, looking back, you know, I am okay with that. And I think it was a sacrifice worthy because that I never kept that out of my mind. I knew travel was something I really wanted to do. And so I made it a mission after college for myself too, not only career wise, you know, and building that up, but. I knew that that it was it was just what I needed in my life, and I made it. Uh, I was very purposeful behind that. So as much as I was a little disheartened at the time, it turned out to happen for a reason for me. That is my exact regret too. Study abroad <laughs> and missing my trip to Spain with my family. I never got to do it, and I did the exact same thing as you. I got pissed off, and I've traveled all over the world now. <laughs> Thank God I skipped that one uh, that one uh, summer or that one semester. Well, Nevada, thank you so much for making time and for uh, sharing your insight. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the Edge of Excellence. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. 